Welcome to Angie TV, the place to be for inspirational stories from around the world that connect us as human beings. And the purpose of this show is to highlight our commonalities as co-creators of our world. As always, no judgment as we hang out with very cool people from all parts of our planet. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, please send me a DM to Angela Soph Music. Today, my guest, I am so excited to introduce you to... If you don't already know her, the award-winning music artist, Galen Leah. Did I say that right? Yeah, it's Galen Lee. Oh, gosh. I should have <laughs> asked you. <laughs> it's okay. Every, it happens a lot. Don't worry. Well, people mispronounce my name, name all the time, too. So I was going to say, I would have said Sophie, so it's Sof. It's Sof. Sof. Even like worse. Soph. I got it wrong. I know. It's Soph. crazy. Okay. Sorry. So we yeah, both did it's it. all right. My band says I should go by Sophie because it looks like Sophie. That's Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know. Maybe I'll change it. Who knows? Anyway, so Galen Lee won NPR's music, Music's Tiny Desk Contest in 2016, and not long after, she hit the road with her husband, Paul. So far, she has toured in 45 states and nine countries and captivated audiences around the world with her unique mix of haunting original songs and traditional fiddle tunes. Galen is also a speaker on disability rights, finding inner freedom and accessibility in the arts. She's currently working on a memoir about her touring adventures and disability advocacy that she plans to release in 2022. She's also a very cool person, and I'm so excited to have her on. So thank you, Galen, for being here. Well, thanks for having me. You're so awesome to join me. Um, I'd like to start, just tell us a little bit about you, your, like, your, where you come from, where you grew up, where you spent your childhood, and sort of bring us up to speed on what you're doing now, like hyperspeed. Yep, hyperspeed. Um, Well, I grew up in northern Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota. So if you look at a map of the Great Lakes, we're actually on the very tip of Lake Superior. So it's a really beautiful town with lots of water and boats from all over the world. And it's a pretty cool place to live, although the winters are like six months long. It's very cold um, and snowy. So I grew up here and started performing violin um, just for fun in orchestra as a fifth grader in school and then um, moved to college down in St. Paul, Minnesota, the capital. And after college, came back up to Duluth and started performing in folk bands and, um, you know, songwriting. And that led me to where I am today, which was uh, touring and being a professional musician full time. But yeah, Duluth was a pretty awesome place with a pretty vibrant music scene um, to grow up, and I live here again now, um, and I really like it. Okay, so you're back in your hometown. I am, yep. Um, moved back after college, and I wasn't really planning to stay here, but I ended up meeting my husband and performing, um, which, you know, like for audiences, not just in orchestras, and I got really hooked on that, and I just didn't want to leave because we do have a really nice music scene that's really cooperative and um, vibrant and just really active. And so I just didn't feel like leaving after that. And Lake Superior draws you in. Once you get obsessed with Lake Superior, it's hard to think about going away from the water. Oh, I love that. I grew up by the water too, but I've never been to Lake Superior. Sounds beautiful. So tell us, um, tell us about your, if you feel comfortable about your Uh, experience as a kid, you know, growing up with the condition that you have. Tell us, number one, if you can tell us what that is and what, how that was growing up feeling or perhaps being perceived as different, maybe sharing a positive or a negative memory associated with that. Yeah, well, so I have a disability called brittle bones disease or osteogenesis imperfecta. And so it's a collagen disorder. It's a genetic condition. So my bones have always been more fragile than other people's and they broke a lot of them in utero which is why my arms and legs are bent because they kind of healed in that position before I was born actually and um so but uh I had I got an electric wheelchair when I was two and a half and so I was born like right around the time where a lot of changes for disabled people were happening um, pretty rapidly so by the time I was old enough to go to school Um, there was a school with an elevator. And so I was with all my peers. And so I grew up, um, you know, I had a really happy childhood, actually. I think sometimes people assume that 
um, it was harder. And it's not to say that sometimes I didn't get sad about having a disability. Like I would remember once in a while, it would just kind of build up into this frustration and I would cry and talk to my mom and then I'd feel better, but it wouldn't bother me again for like many months. So um, I had a, you know, really cool siblings and my parents, their motto was sort of, if you really want to do it, you'll figure out a way. And, and I had supportive teachers, like I had the orchestra teacher in fifth grade, uh, unlike the experience of a lot of other people with disabilities that I've met, she said, well, you have a good ear, we should try to figure out how to make it possible for you to play. And so we experimented with different um, positions and stuff. And I ended up learning how to play the violin up and down like a cello. And so there, you know, I, don't, I think for me, the memories that I have from childhood are positive ones of like adaptation. Um, you know, my brother Ben, one time when I was little, um, decided he's my oldest brother, there's four of us, and I'm the only one with a disability. And so he decided we should all go on a bike ride together, but I obviously couldn't ride a bike. So he tied me to his newspaper rack with twine, which is extremely dangerous and not a good idea, but we did that. And we all went on a bike ride together and we got busted by my dad's coworker who saw us going down the street and was like, that seems like a bad idea. But, um, but that's kind of how I grew up is like figuring out a way to do stuff. And I was lucky that the people around me were supportive in that way. Um, and then by the time I was maybe 10 to 13, sometime in there, I kind of stopped um, feeling bad about my disability. Like it kind of just dissipated. Um, by then I had learned how to play or was learning how to play. You're very bad at the beginning, but the violin and I had a good group of friends and there was the surgery. I would have had one every summer um, on each limb that I could have maybe straightened my arms and legs. And, um, but the thing is, is they couldn't guarantee how well it would work. Like I might be able to walk regular um, amounts or I might only be able to stand and just to stand, I was like, it doesn't seem worth it to bargain that I might be able to stand. And by the time I started playing violin, um, the idea got even less appealing because it could damage the nerves in your hands. Um, that was a possibility of straightening out your arms because your nerves grow around your bones. And so I decided that, you know, wheelchairs were getting better and better and I had tons of interest. And so I actually didn't get the surgery. And um, and I'm happy about that. I've had other surgeries that I've needed to have for like medically necessary reasons, but the idea that walking is like an ideal that you necessarily want to do is sort of a misconception, I think. I mean, not that some people who can't walk don't wish that they could or try to be able to, but it's not across the board. Everybody is secretly wishing they can walk. Like I've always been um, at this point, like ever since 10 or 13, sometime in that range, really haven't wished that that was something that I could do because I've filled my life up in other ways. So that's, yeah, that's probably the gist of my thoughts on growing up that way. And, and I got lucky. I didn't get bullied. Like I know a lot of people do, and I think that's really terrible and something that is really important for us to work on. Um, but maybe people said stuff behind my back, but in general, I ended up being surrounded by people that were supportive and that's a huge deal. So making sure the world is inclusive is a big goal that's really important. That says a lot also about you. I love that story about your brother. That sounds like my brothers, something they would do. Yeah. I know when you're like, you to the back this of a seems bike. like a great idea. Yeah. This seems like a really smart plan. We but tested just, it out around the block yeah. and it worked. So we were like, you know, making it so it's going to work around the neighborhood yep that's exactly. so awesome but what it says too is probably a testament to your family is that that you were raised in an environment where you probably i mean i'm making this broad assumption but you were taught to to view your your uh situation as an asset you know like what can i do not what can't i but like what exploring the world um from a really positive lens i think that's amazing so that's yeah, and I, I'm sure that has a lot to do with my parents. I mean, um, I've gotten to study and learn about disability rights in other parts of the world. And the people, even in countries where 
disability rights aren't recognized or people don't have accessibility or opportunities, generally people with supportive parents are the, the few that break through and like start their own businesses or do this other thing. So it would be totally wrong to leave out my parents. I mean, I think they wouldn't, I mean, the funny thing is my mom would be like, eh, we just kind of treated her like the other kids, but clearly um, not treating me differently at least was a really big deal, you know, um, making sure that I didn't feel somehow limited artificially um, was a really big deal. I love that. So awesome. Well, your music, um, I mean, that's the perfect segue into my next question because your music has reached thousands of people and I'm sure it's given hope to so many more. Um, and by the way, if you guys haven't watched her music videos, um, like they're on YouTube and we'll put links to everything below, but it's just really stunning. It's so beautiful. Your playing is like a magical transportation device. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Is. It's so pretty. Um, okay. So your, your music, how has it informed your journey as, as a person? Like, how do you feel like your abilities or disabilities and music have walked together? Oh, in a lot of ways. I mean, um, I think that your disability just kind of by default. So I think, I think of disability as almost like a cultural identity at this point, or like a, a lens that you see the world in a, in a way that transcends just like the physical part of you. And so my music is definitely informed by my disability. Like, um, you know, growing up, um, even though I did have an awesome childhood and had a lot of really, really positive memories, I did have times where I would break bones, kind of not spontaneously, but I would fall out of my chair and where somebody maybe would just be like, oh, that hurt. I would actually break my arm or whatever. And um, mm -hmm. one thing, hold on one sec. Hey, Paul, can you stay in one place possibly? Because you keep coming into the interview. <laughs> okay. Or do you want me to move? I guess it's okay. Okay, we don't, don't mind. Know. Okay, as long as it doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Um, um, so, okay. My dog's back here. It's fine. <laughs> I guess that's true. Your dog is back here. That's fine. So, um, so the your music automatically, I think, is written from the lens that you view the world. And one thing that breaking bones occasionally throughout life you know, you might be having a totally normal day and then all of a sudden the next six weeks are very different for you, you know? Um, that idea kind of teaches you the lesson of impermanence at a really young age and not just like mortality, but the idea that things can change really quickly. And that theme has come into my writing a lot of different ways and different times. And then the other theme of... Um, you know, that life is both joyful and sour, sour, sorrowful at the same time and that you're dealing with um, pain and happiness together often. Like you can't compartmentalize the things in your life that are going on. That idea is in a lot of my songs and that's definitely because of my disability because I have, there's this one time that I had a, a back surgery that um, we thought was going to be a two week recovery time and it ended up being like six weeks of bed rest because it just didn't go as planned. And that was my senior year. So I didn't get to start senior year with everybody else. But mm. ironically, I have a lot of positive memories from that time because every day after school, my friends would come and like lay in the hospital bed with me and we would just like talk and make each other laugh. And so that is a like kind of what I'm talking about is the idea that life isn't just all terrible or all positive. There's all this stuff. And then the other thing, the other thing about um, disability and music interacting is the way that I play is pretty different. If you see a video mm -hmm. of me, I'm holding the violin like a cello and by necessity, just the way that it works is because I hold it like a cello, I also do cello vibrato. And so I, I sound different than I would if I was playing the violin up on my shoulder. And so I think the way your music um, is made is partly also because of the way that you sometimes adapt your instrument. So they have grown together to be a big kind of like, it's hard, to, you can't really separate the disability and the music at this point, I don't think. Does that answer your question? Yes. That's okay, what I was cool. wondering because okay, I, yes. I felt that like when I watched you play and I read about your, like the technique that you use to play, which is like your yeah. own 
your own creation and how it actually informs like the sound that comes out. Yeah. Not to mention what you write about, but just like the pure sound of your music. Like those two seem so intertwined to me and and like what a really cool raw gift I think to give the world is like a product that really truly no one else can create because yeah you're the one that's physically crafting it. I mean, I think that's really really cool. Well, and that's the thing is, I think a lot of the ideas coming from disability culture cross over to everyone, but we just don't always think of it that way. So like, Mm -hmm. if you're a classical guitarist, but you don't have the same exact technique as everyone, um, you could quit because your teacher says, oh, that's just not how it's done. Or you could just say, well, this is how I I do it and continue because I think um, innovation can come from like the actual way we play stuff. And it doesn't just have to be disabled people adapting. I think, um, you know, Django Reinhardt, didn't he only have like a couple fingers on mm-hmm. his? Yeah, I mean, like he obviously played the way he played because of his body. And I think that there's probably a lot of examples of that, but we just don't think about it as much um, until it's so obvious that you can't not think about it, you know? Mm-hmm. I think it's the same thing when people have really limiting beliefs about putting out something into the world and they feel like, well, what do I have to offer that's unique? And really every single person is a unique product just by existing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, me as a singer, like I don't sound like anyone else really because, you know, and you the same for you, like no one has the same set of pipes that you do. So you might as well create the most beautiful thing that you can, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's really, really cool. Um, Okay. So pre pandemic, you were touring, right? Yes. And um, you were also talking about diversity and inclusion, like these similar topics. Yeah. Why do you think, I mean, I have my own opinions, but why does this matter? Like, why do we need to shine light on this, on, on, on diversity, on acceptance, on um, people with disability and, and what changes do we need to make? Well, I think it's important to talk about it partly because um, we don't we don't have equality in America for you know disability for sure, but there's other forms of diversity where there's still these um, institutional or un unacknowledged like barriers right to equality, and the problem is is most people just don't learn about them, especially in terms of disability. We don't, most schools don't have a disability rights education program where they talk about the history of disability and like how people have shaped, you know, fought for their rights. And and so if you never see anyone with a disability in your culture, you're not going to think about them in any other context either. And so I think music can kind of, and, and because art is like, a place where you're not necessarily using your like argumentative brain. You're kind of open to just taking things in. I think art is a really good way to like, not just normalize disability, but introduce people to it. And then the other thing is if you leave out other marginalized communities and disabled people, if you leave them out from culture, as I said, like if you like my music, you have to acknowledge that it's important to hear from disabled people because I wouldn't be making the music that I make if I wasn't disabled. So I also think we're just limit, like limiting what we get to hear in the world. And so just from an artistic standpoint alone, I think it's important to have diversity because it just creates things that couldn't be created otherwise. And so um, for, so yeah, for both like amplifying social justice and then just acknowledging how cool art can be when it comes from different places. Um, those are both reasons I think it's important to talk about it. So what needs to change? Like if you could list the top three, like what, yeah, what um, needs to change and what can like the average person do that's sitting listening? What, like, what would you like them to know? Well, I think there's three things as an artist, I guess, specifically, I would say the first is to just learn, learn about it. Like, if you, you know, I, I realized when the George Floyd thing happened, how little I know about racial inequity realistically, because I grew up in Northern Minnesota and we just didn't, we did not do it justice in our culture up here. And, and so I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta learn some stuff. And so learning about the issues, but not just learning and, but actually listening, like, um, 
if somebody says this is problematic and they're from that community, then you owe it to them to listen because otherwise it's like you saying, well, I hear you, but I, I don't think you're right about your own life, you know, and that's not okay. So listening and learning, and then the two practical things I would say, uh, if you're talking especially to artists, how to make the arts more accessible, I would encourage musicians and artists who go to venues and do events to, to make it the new norm that you won't hold an event at a place that's not accessible. In 2020, um, you know, the disability rights laws in America are 30 years old, so they're not new. And so any venue at this point that hasn't made the accommodations or moved to a new space where they could meet those accommodations, any venue who hasn't done that by now, I don't think um, deserves to like keep having a place in the art world. And I know that seems kind of like extreme, but I toured for many, many years, well, like three full years of touring and realizing that things aren't going to change unless people say, hey, why well, then I can't play here because it's just not accessible. Um, that's what it takes. And I've seen it in my own life and my own work. And I know that if more artists joined in, that it would happen a lot faster because people do make changes. Like I've had plenty of venues build ramps that weren't there and um, widen doors and like, you know, do things that make the places more accessible because I won't go otherwise. And I think that's a powerful testament to what we can do as individuals, but how much cooler would it be if we were doing this um, as a collective, as an arts, you know, we wouldn't want to accept, I would assume, like, venue that has blatantly racist policies and so at this point I think we need to like be moving to include ableism and and discrimination based on disability which is access you know if you can't get in to see a show or to perform a show then the venue is not really all about equality and so mm -hmm. that's the other thing and then the last thing I would say is um in the age of the digital world that we live in I think it's really important for people putting out content to try to make that content accessible with things like captions um, mm -hmm. and image descriptors on like, you know, there's always a place where you can add alt text, which like allows people with screen readers to know what the picture that you just put up says. Um, and just trying to make the world more accessible that way, um, especially as we are doing this COVID thing where everything is virtual right now you know I think it's really important so I started because and it's not like there's always a learning curve so you're not going to go from like no access to perfect overnight but for me um, I started realizing that if I was going to make um, a decision which I did a couple of years ago to only play at accessible venues then I had to do the same for my online show so I do an online show every week and I started captioning them in August and it's a commitment but I think again if we were all doing it together it you know how like the market decides like what companies invest in I think it would become easier and more like cheaper probably to, to realistically mm -hmm. provide that service if everybody wanted it um, rather than just a few people so yeah. yeah are there services that do live closed captioning mm -hmm. um, I work with a company called ACS captions and they they have people that are like listening to your show mm -hmm. and they caption them live um and they show up on youtube the technology i mean that's an area that's like so developing right now a lot of these streaming platforms like zoom actually is one of the best ones for captions because that that the captioner can be like a third guest and just sit without their camera on and actually add the captions in real time as you're talking and it can be right mm -hmm. in the zoom um, but every platform most platforms have some way to caption but not all of them are easy yet because it's a developing field so um, I want to see it just become easier and easier to to get there are some places like Google Meet has an auto caption where you can select captions and there's not even a person it's just like he, it's like voice recognition basically it's not perfect but for the low budget option something like Google Meets for interviews um, just makes the captions pop up mm. automatically. And that's pretty cool. So I mean, there are ways around it if you don't have like a big budget. Um, right now, I'm probably like not making money on my shows because of captions online, which is like kind of too bad, but I'm assuming that that will eventually write itself. I think it's important. I just really wanna see 
us moving in the right direction. And so the more people that are doing it, it's only going to get easier. You know, at the first, the first few people that commit to that probably, you know, it's like kind of a pain, but that's the whole point is that it gets easier for everybody after that. Yeah. I really love that you shared that. I would not have thought of that. And, and well, yeah, seems, and that's the thing. We don't talk about it very much. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it seems like actually a type of technology that would be really easy to implement because we have so much voice recognition. I mean, with Siri and Google and I mean, like there are all these audio, you know, like recognition programs and software, but it's just not converted into text. So yeah. And even, even if you can't do it live, like, like some people can't afford, and I totally understand that, like to hire a captioner for every show because yeah. they're not cheap or whatever. Like um, I have a thing worked out with ACS because I'm every week till September, 2021. So they gave me a little bit of a deal because I'm only a person. I'm not like a university or a business. Right. But there are ways like, so if you're pre-producing a video, there's programs, there's one called Capwing, K-A-P-W-I-N-G, where it's like a beta mode where you upload the video and then it, it will auto-populate the captions, but you can correct any mistakes that you see. And that, so especially if you're not doing your video live, there's really no reason not to have captions at this point because there is software out there that's not exorbitantly expensive. I think a pro edition might be like 25 bucks a month or something, but if you're doing it like, as a way to generate income or have fans or grow your career, I think it's a worthwhile investment. And they actually say that more people watch videos with captions anyways, because it's, you don't have to have your volume way up to hear it, you know? So I don't know, it's something to think about that I think if you think about it for making yourself accessible to people who maybe wouldn't be able to access it otherwise, hopefully that is like motivation to make some changes, you know, for all kinds of art. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to have to caption this video. <laughs> I'm stuck in well, the heart. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cool thing to realize. You'll get yeah. comments like eventually, because when I started doing it, people were like, oh, I have hearing loss. And now I finally know what the lyrics are. And yeah. it's cool to know that you're like, oh, that actually does matter. Um, so, but it's, it's not, you know, I don't blame people who don't think of it because we never talk about it. So that's the whole, that's why I do the speaking part like that's the whole reason is we just haven't had enough education about it in the past so how do you change that besides educating people you know absolutely that's i think it's so cool that you're doing that like wearing that hat and being that person because it also it takes a lot of work and and diligence and compassion you know for the people that don't understand or don't know like there's a lot of patience and explaining involved and so thanks for doing that. That's really awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank well, thanks. Cool. Um, okay. So bring us up to speed in the next couple of years, or actually just this year, right? You're going to be working on your book. Yep. And will you tell us about that? Like what, when can we find out like it's release and do you have a title, any of that? Um, yeah, I'm so excited about this book. So the book is basically going to be part memoir and then part what we just talked about, like, like inserting this discussion of disability in the arts into it as like kind of mini essays throughout the book because I just think there's you know every time I do an interview or chat with someone um, unless they themselves are like a disability scholar people are like wow I didn't know that and it it kind of like rings true to me like how little we talk about it and how excited I am to get this book out into the world because I just think it'll be neat to have that view out in public more um, and so I'm writing it this year. Um, the The way to kind of learn about it is I, I have a Patreon. I started a Patreon about a year ago specifically for this purpose because I'm planning to send excerpts to my patrons as I go and like get their input about like what is interesting to them or what they want to hear about or like do they want more of this or less of this or like did they are, you know, am I saying this clearly? And so that'll kind of like be the writing team, which I'm really excited about that. Um, and then the book should come out at the end of 2022. That's my hope, my guess. And I don't have a name because here's the deal. I was going to call it From the Tiny Desk to the Big World, but now I'm just at home. <laughs> like, that was like, and then back to their living room. You know, like, I don't really know how it fits because the pandemic really changed. Like, I wasn't planning to even write about the pandemic, really. I was going to stop before then, but now it's clearly 
a part of this story, you know, seven yeah. months in. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not sure what I'm going to name it yet, but I, you know, the Tiny Desk Contest really was what sparked all of our adventures. And even now online, I wouldn't have like an audience for my work if it hadn't been for the Tiny Desk and all the touring that followed after it. So it might be something like from the Tiny Desk to the big world and back again or something. Cause I mean, this whole coming back for coronavirus was not expected and definitely didn't think it would last this long. So it's like, I got to factor that into the title somehow probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun though. I hope, I mean, I think it will be, I hear writing is half really painful and half really fun. So we'll see. Like that you just like life, right? Yeah. No kidding. It is it's true. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I can't wait. So, how can we like follow you and find out that you know yes. coming out and all that? How can people f- follow the journey? The best place to start is at my website. It's violinscratches.com. And the two most important pieces on there, the or three most important, I would say, if you want to keep up, because the one thing about writing is I'm not going to be on social media from November to April, which is a little different for me. Um, so the only three ways really that you'll be able to keep in touch is I have a newsletter, um, that I send out about once a month or every other month. Um, so you can join my newsletter mailing list at my website. Um, you can learn more about that Patreon. It, it, it's like a monthly subscription, sort of like public radio where you, um, contribute a certain amount every month, like $5 a month or whatever it is or whatever you want. And then I'll be, that's how I'm going to send out my excerpts as to those people that are contributing and then the other place um is through youtube i do that weekly show and it's going to be happening all year for sure and probably beyond that honestly because you can record those kind of shows from anywhere um and so um i do a weekly show with a special guest every week and they play three songs and we chat and then i play my own music at the end of every show and so i'll definitely be giving you updates um, you know, I just chat with the audience. You can ask questions. How is it coming along? And I can tell you. Um, so those are the three best ways to keep in touch right now. And you can find all of those links at my website, which is violinscratches.com. So awesome. Yay. Okay, go check it out, you guys. Um, the last question that I always ask guests is, what is your favorite thing to eat? And what is your favorite place in the world? Oh, um, my favorite thing to eat is probably, oh man, that's so hard. Um, a lot, I like food a lot. Um, besides coffee, which is an essential part of my life blood, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for coffee. Um, I guess I would have to say enchiladas maybe. Um, I, I really like Mexican food and on the road, I get it a lot. Like we had a taco tour, we called it, where we were going down through Minnesota, through Arizona, New Mexico, all the way up through California. And we had tacos all every time we stopped, basically. So Mexican <laughs> food, yay. And then my favorite place in the world so far, um, I mean, I, I studied French for a lot of years in school. And we finally got to go to Paris um, to tour. Like, I played a show there. And the first night we got there, because I added a few days, because I was like, well, we're finally in France, you know. Um, the first day we got there, it was their Fête de la Musique. So they have music in every possible space for one night in Paris. And so, but we didn't know that we were there that day. So we like went out to walk around in our hotel room and or, or, or out of our hotel. And there was this like Brazilian band that played outside for like four hours. And it was just like the most magical thing. So Paris was a very special place in my heart. I mean, and I, I mean, yeah, there's so many places though. That's the hard, it's a really hard question, but I would say Paris for now. Yeah. I love that. That's so awesome. I used to live in Brazil and I love, I love Brazilian music, but Brazilian music in Paris, I bet was even cooler. (laughs) It it was pretty awesome. I'm not going to lie. I would love to go to South America though. I have not been at all. Um, but I have some fans from Brazil that come to my YouTube shows and stuff. So someday it's like, it's kind of funny when the the internet does kind of introduce you to people all over the world, but then you're like, also, would it be like five people at my show in Brazil? I'm not sure. Like, <laughs> would it be those five from YouTube? Or like, so someday, someday, I want to try going down there for sure. Yeah, 
You'd love it. Oh, that's okay. so great. Well, thank you so much, Galen Lee, for joining yes. us. So appreciate it. And we wish you all the best on your book and everything. So keep it thank up. You. Thank you for sh sharing your light with us. And thanks for doing this. This is really awesome. Battle has been won.